the Diesel Podcast. Digital integration in English as a second or other language. Episode 58, interview with Dr. Sarah Thomas. Welcome to Diesel. This is episode 58. Mm-hmm. We are your Yikes. hosts. I am 2022. Brent 2022. 2022. And I'm interrupting mm-hmm. Brent. Right. <laughs> it's me. It's that's, Ishelle. It's like, that's what 2022 <laughs> is. We're and just, I'm Ishelle Reyes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, Brent. Welcome back. Uh, thank you. Uh, hey, you Ishelle. were just in. I was just yes. in not New York. Uh, <laughs> New York got... <laughs> Even though I discovered you, you it, canceled I, canceled, <laughs> I, dis- I canceled my trip. So I, uh, oh. uh, well, so you, therefore you chose a colder place. Yeah. I went to Alaska um, and it was, <laughs> uh, what do we have ratings on this show? It was butt cold. It was very, very <laughs> cold. Okay. We've said worse. <laughs> yeah, we've probably said worse. We've said worse. Yeah. Um, it was uh, uh, quite cold, but it was beautiful. I did see uh, the Aurora Borealis. Uh, from oh, that's from the airplane, once. but so like from it, the airplane. Yeah, it was kind of. A, I mean, it was cool to see it from the airplane because that's its own thing. Because you're way up high. Yeah, because yeah, you're way up high. But also, we did not unfortunately get to see it from the ground. Like when by mm-hmm. the, we landed mm-hmm. and then it started getting overcast and we missed it from the ground. But mm-hmm. uh, but I can at least officially say I've seen it. But I think we're going to challenge it one more time and try and see mm-hmm. it another time. This time future. you should go to Iceland. That's where I'm going to go. I'm going to go. To, <laughs> I mean, sometime <laughs> in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back and COVID free. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm still in Japan and I got to see snow. Uh, I mean, snow like in the city. Cool. It snowed for a day, then it melted. And then the other thing I did is I, as you know, I'm always running uh, at night. I, I, I run. That's my exercise routine. Midnight but runner. I, I did not stretch enough and I hurt my knees. Oh, so no. I've been kind of bedridden and not, not doing a lot, letting, letting everything heal. So that's what I've been doing. I'm sorry to hear that. That's a bummer. I hope you feel better soon. Yeah. So let's get into it. Yes. All right. Today I am super, well, we're both super excited because our special guest is someone that I found on Twitter first uh, in 2014, I think it was. Yeah. Um, uh, and her name is Dr. Sarah Thomas. Let me give her the official intro. Um, Dr. Sarah Thomas is a regional technology coordinator in a large district in Maryland, and she is a founder of EduMatch, a project that empowers educators to make global connections across common areas of interest. She is an international speaker and presenter, and she participated in the technical working group to refresh the 2017 ISD standards for educators, which we've covered in one of our episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sarah is a, the co-author of the ISTE Digital Equity Series, Closing the Gap. Um, she received the ISTE Making It Happen Award for her extraordinary commitment, leadership, courage, and persistence in improving digital learning opportunities for students. So she, we are very lucky. <laughs> uh, we had to work with time zones in order to make this happen, but we weren't going to miss this opportunity. <laughs> yeah. um, but I just wanted to say that when I was kind of a newish teacher, I think I'd been teaching for about four years and I found uh, Sarah through the EduMatch Twitter account. And I just remember at that time, I think I had discovered Voxer and Voxer had like a, <laughs> an edu, ed, an, an ed camp, a Voxer ed camp. And I remember I was like, what, this is crazy. There's a conference on, on Voxer and, and it's free. And, and I just, um, you know, and, and from then on there's just, she just has done so many projects. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And then I also want to say that I saw her at ISD. I think she was getting ready for a, a, an interview or something with the ISTE people. And I had just come out of the room and I always thought, that's Sarah Thomas. I really want to go say hi to her, but I don't want to bother her. And I just, I, I'm too, I'm shy. So 
was really hard for me to walk up to her. And also she was probably getting ready for the interview. So, oh, but I was starstruck. Anyway, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Sarah, welcome to the show. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here. Thank you both for, for having me. And I have to say the feeling is absolutely mutual. I love what you all do uh, for education, for the community, uplifting people, getting the information out. And, you know, I love listening to your show and just following both of your work. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, we'll all, this is what will happen is someday when we all get to a conference together, we'll all be too shy to talk to each other. <laughs> we'll all just stare at each other from across the room. Well, I'll just open up a Voxer room and then we'll be like, hey, is that really no. you? <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> All right. So, um, so Sarah, uh, we've had uh, a couple of interactions. We've done. We've done a couple of. Um, I think was it last year we did a, a Q um, podcasters mm-hmm. thing. I think together. I mean. Yeah, podcasters roundtable it's yeah. all melded together so we've, we've right. had we've had brief uh some interactions over over the years too and uh and then just following each other's work but we're really uh, like Michelle said we are so happy to have you on here and uh you know uh we we've talked about this before but as you know um the show is fairly casual so we'll we'll go where uh where you want to go and where we want to go and just kind of hang out for a bit and let people get to know you as well um we, we often do talk about in our our little corner of ed tech in the in the ESL world or whatever whatever acronym you want to use for ESL. E-S-O-L. E- E-N- E-N- oh, geez, okay. E-A-L, E-N-L. It's okay. It's like 6 a.m. for Brent. I know. So, um, <laughs> so, um, but we've talked about this, but I, I think, you know, our world is still kind of connecting to a lot of these ideas or starting like starting to learn and getting getting quite a lot better than it was even two years ago. But um, but you know, I think that it's really great to have people with different perspectives and people who are um, uh, kind of exploring zones that maybe uh, our field of teachers hasn't totally jumped into. And so I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about uh, quite a few of those things as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just super geeked to be here. So, <laughs> so uh, we have to um, touch base and talk about EduMatch. Uh, we've done episodes on networking, but there are, you know, as much as we like to believe that the rest of the world uh, knows what's going on and is uh, knows exactly what we do and likes what we do, um, there's many teachers who aren't familiar. Yeah, sometimes I think, why you haven't heard of Google Docs? I think I'd put this at this point, if you haven't, uh, I'll worry. But um, there's teachers who aren't familiar with EduMatch, especially in our field. We we tend to we teach um, ESOL in the adult world, um, and so can you give us a snapshot of what to expect in this community? What is EduMatch, and just what to expect for somebody who might be listening? Yeah, absolutely. So EduMatch is a grassroots organization. Uh, We started back in 2014, and the mission was to connect educators globally along similar lines of interest. So we first started out with a Twitter uh, person of the day. So we would feature a person of the day. They would submit a bio, and then, you know, we would tweet out uh, using bits of their bio, matching it to hashtags. And as the database grew, then we would tag people who were, you know, who had those similar interests. And then as a community started to grow, then people brought their ideas why don't you try doing X, Y, and Z? So that's how we ended up next on Voxer. Someone uh, mm-hmm. suggested doing a Voxer group. And that was that was gold. That Voxer group, that original Voxer group is still going to this day. Very active. That's People amazing. are talking about it like every day. Um, we have a second Voxer group as well, a spinoff group, because that one filled up. Um, and I mean, it's... <laughs> how do you fill up a Voxer group? Yeah, they have a limit. They have a what? limit. It's like 500. And it's you not 500 the people... Yeah, wow. it's not 500 yeah. people talking every day. It's more like maybe <laughs> 10, 10 people maybe talking every day. But I mean, may, and maybe like 20 or 30 kind of bounce in and out. But um, but we, you know, we don't kick anybody out because a lot of times people just come back uh, to mm-hmm. Voxer after hiatus. Um, but we have a second room as well. And that room is uh, going as well. That room, the culture is a little different. It tends to kind of pop off whenever there's an event or something like that. And mm-hmm. people um, start buzzing about it and kind of get the word out. 
Um, and then from there, then we just kept on expanding as people brought their ideas. So we moved to doing a, something called a tweet and talk, which is like a video uh-huh. panel. Um, mm-hmm. And anyone, you know, anyone with an interest in the topic could sign up to be on panel. And then we would pair it with the Twitter chat. Um, we put that kind of on pause, but we're going to bring it back in 2022. Um, and then we started doing EdCam Voice, like you said. Uh, that was initially not associated with Edge Match, but eventually, you know, started to become uh, more associated with edge match and then uh let me see from there we started uh doing publishing so mm-hmm. right now probably the most active part i would say of edge match is the book publishing so we put out over 75 titles um and you know we uh we're really really excited to amplify the voices of practitioners just to learn and grow from one another um we have done a nonprofit, so our mini grants we just did round two and we're about to notify the winners um, whenever, you know, whenever the board meets again and we're going to go ahead and notify the winners of the mini grants. And uh, the last thing is the professional learning. We started working with districts and doing things like asynchronous book studies, as well as synchronous uh, professional learning opportunities. So it's really kind of grown over the years, thanks to the people who have joined and uh, contributed their ideas and uh, their talents and skills. Kind of grown. Just, just, just kind of, you know, we put out 70 books and just kind of grown. And the, the Foxer chat's still going, you know, almost what, 10 years later. Wow. I have to, oh, yeah. I have to say right. that one of, one of my real favorite things about it is it's just so teacher focused, right? Like a lot of these things, it feels, feels like people kind of launch these things and then they're like, eventually they're like, oh, we're not going to make money off of teachers. We're mm-hmm. going to make money off of like doing, you know, like a, whatever the, some uh, some other part of the field right and it's like and i really feel like the the, the thing that i love about edu match is it's it's always so like let's get into those teachers let's get into real people who are actually working who are mm-hmm. actually doing stuff it's not a, you know it's not a bunch of people who are like oh yeah i i uh you know i i once took a, a class on teaching 20 years ago and now i'm you know <laughs> like, like you know it's, it's like there's so so much real focus on everything so i really i do appreciate that you guys kind of keep that um it, it does feel even as you grow so much it does feel continually grassroots and and for for the people so mm-hmm. I just want to say thank you for kind of keeping that spirit alive with it too I appreciate that thank you yeah. so much I'm I'm actually excited to hear that you're going to be uh doing the tweet and talks again because I was I was watching one and um the topic was how to keep how do we encourage high school students to join the teaching profession and it was the you know the panel and you have the the students and the teachers talking and it's everybody's everybody's uh, own story of how to do it and of course they're talking about treat teachers with respect and you know pay them what they're worth and I'm like yes and then because we have the same issue with in in you know as language teachers it's just hard and the lifespan of a teacher I don't I'm, usually three to five years you know in the field and then with COVID I don't know what that's doing to our poor teachers yeah Yeah, it's really rough right now you know just even Mm -hmm. seeing hearing the discussions seeing on my timeline on Twitter just what people are saying and yeah this is a very difficult time um you know but yeah absolutely but that just you know underscores the need for that support you know Mm -hmm. that that we can we can provide each other with um and there's many other things that we need as well, but that's that's definitely one thing that has helped me a lot. Oh, for sure. I, I know. Um, I mean, I also met Brent through Twitter and here we are and uh, having that community there, even like right now, I feel like I'm kind of on hiatus because I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm in a different country, so I'm a little bit disconnected, but I still go in there and, and read what teachers are going through. And I and it breaks my heart, you know, to, especially in elementary schools where people have to make a choice or don't have a choice that's a good choice you know to make especially right now yeah so but, i think this kind of if we can kind of uh-huh. co- move into this with this covid uh-huh. conversation uh-huh. so sarah i know you've been seeing a lot of different things going on over the last couple of years um uh-huh. you know we've been I, I think a lot of so many of us are still processing like we're, i mean we're, we're still in the middle of it you know it's like a lot of people want to imagine okay we're light at the end of the tunnel and then of course like omicron hits or whatever else it is right and so it's like i, I want to be done talking about this but at the same time <laughs> like it's it's an it's an integral part of our everyday lives and major concerns for teachers and for students and health and all of those types of things. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I know these answers will always change. Um, but like, as we've been kind of navigating the, wor- 
world with COVID, um, do you feel like you've gained any wisdom, like looking back over the last couple of years and kind of like, oh, these are the things we've learned, or these are the things that like can really make changes for us, or these are, you know, uh, I guess we're just kind of wanting to get your thoughts on like how maybe uh, this this modern world has has changed your your perspective on things. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, this has been a, an extremely challenging time for everyone, um, and I would say that there have been some lessons learned and some some positive things that I have seen um, as a result that schools and districts are doing. Like, uh, I'll say the district that I'm in, um, I've, I've seen kind of a renewed focus on connecting with parents, um, and I absolutely love that. Like, um, there were so many materials made available to parents, and prior to the pandemic, then, um, you know, the, we, we had the slogan, parents are our partners for a few years in our district, um, but it was nothing like what we saw in March 2020. Like, um, all of a sudden, there was there was kind of an invitation for parents to, you know, connect um, in, in so many different ways. Like, um, there were, um, you know, parent facing materials on technology so that they could help their students adapt. And they were translated in uh, multiple languages. And I thought that that was, that was fantastic. Um, and I, I think that they usually do that, but I don't think that there was like, I don't think the content was the same in terms of uh, the technology, you know, here's how you use zoom, here's how you use blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I thought that that was great. Um, parent centers that they created so that parents could come in and get technical support and uh, training, you know, um, on different things. I thought that that was, that was fantastic. So uh, definitely want to hold on to that. And I see that now that we have returned to in-person um, right now, we are, we are virtual for like Actually, no, I take that back. Starting on Tuesday, we're back to face to face. Um, But we were virtual for three weeks because of Omicron. Um, But yeah, I'm hoping that they hold on to that. Um, And, you know, there there have been so many things that that people have been stretched to do. All all stakeholders, you know, the educators, the students, parents. um, And and I just was inspired by seeing um, folks come together and do what they had to do. To, to make this work. Um, and I would say in my district, like I, I don't have uh, kids yet. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the parent, the full parent perspective, but from, uh, from what I was seeing, then for many students, then it seemed to go very, very well. So, um, and I've heard different stories about how sometimes things did not go well, but I feel like um, the steps that my superintendent took um, to just ensure that students had what they needed um, to to be successful, then then I feel like that did help a lot. Can I follow up on that a little bit? Just because sure. I, I think the uh, you know it, it sounds like you're you're in a supportive environment, kind of similar to mine, um, which I'm always yeah. really really grateful for because it's like yeah. the uh, my admin is really working to support and protect students and protect teachers and to like say hey you want to try something different try it out see what happens right those types of things and I, I think like I want to you know like I, I see so much on Twitter or on Instagram or teacher misery or whatever that mm-hmm. it's like all this terrible stuff just happens all the time and like and I mm-hmm. I, I I want to reinforce that there's also what you're saying is there's amazing stuff happening too, right? Things that never would have happened before things that, um, allow for maybe right now it doesn't feel good, but in a year in two years in five years, it's laying the groundwork for a more positive learning experiences for everybody. Um, I think this like, there's been a massive shift to the ideas of like student centered, more student centered teaching. You know, a lot of us already were there, but a lot of teachers weren't there before. And so now they're kind of starting to see Mm -hmm. that, recognize that like, Hey, some of these students don't have, um, you know, the same benefits that I do or that I did growing up, or this is a lot of these students are growing up in a rough situation or like even taking classes from home. Like we're, we're joking about my situation right now. It's like, you know, my, my, my wife's like walking around over there and my, my son's walking around over there and they're like trying to stay out of the way and not get recorded. And like, and it's like, <laughs> I'm trying to do this on a early on a Saturday morning uh, before people are awake. But like a lot of kids, if they're studying from home, for example, they're like everybody around, if they got a family of four or five and people are running around in the house and they've got a tiny little apartment like I do and they're making it work. Like it's not perfect. It's not, it's not always great, but like, I, I, I also, I just wanted to kind of follow up with that kind of shout out to the people who are 
trying to do it and are trying to make it work and are trying to be supportive of that. Cause I think that's really important to recognize as well. And not just all the heavy, <laughs> you know, downside, like bummer stuff that of course it's there, but like, I don't, I, I'm not super into like toxic positivity, but I'm also not into like toxic negativity either. I want to kind of balance that. Because is there non toxic negativity? Uh, yeah, good. <laughs> There's cathartic negativity. <laughs> yeah, but I definitely hear you on that. Definitely. So there, there have been some some wins, and I mean, it's it's not always been like you said. It's not always been like perfect, but you know. There have been some gains. Um, one, one thing, one other thing um, is that now we have a virtual online school in my district, and this is like new. Um, there was one at the elementary level, but I think that the students are going back at the end of uh, the semester. So they'll they'll be starting back face to face in February. But for the middle and high school students, I think it's going to the end of the year. So hopefully, you know, as you said, and that kind of lays the groundwork for uh, for more of these so that the uh, parents and families have options. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I also wanted to mention that one of the, the great, that this discussion has always been on, you know, what kind of scores we're giving students and how we're assessing them and what, you know, what points we're attaching to those assessments. And now the conversation is really heating up on, you know, are we, how are we going to measure that student progress and success and um, for example at, at USC at the university they have the pass or fa- uh, pass or no pass I don't think they're calling it fail they're calling it pass or no pass they just extended it which means uh, to me I, I see that the conversation is really you know they're making allowances and uh, realizing that yeah we, it, we're, it's different times and if you're allowing a pass or no pass and what does that tell you about our old, old system right mm-hmm. um so that's one of the i think the positive things that are, that's coming out of it at least for in in with with working with adults sometimes you know with language learners it's it's, it's hard and especially uh teaching through covid so i want to shift over to challenges that you've that you've seen or that you encounter often, especially um, with our language learners and um, tech use. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, particularly during remote learning, when we uh, first started that in 2020, then, you know, as I said, and there were some translated materials that we put out for parents and for students. Um, However, you know, sometimes there is a, uh, there are some nuances that don't necessarily come through um, with that material because it's, it's like a one sheeter or, you know, a video or something like that, or an overview. But um, a lot of times there's like some nuances. So being able to have the resources in order to go deeper into details, because I mean, even if you give it to a native speaker, you know, um, a native English speaker in, in the English language, then, then there's a lot of questions still at that point, you know, like, how do I, you know, like, this is cool, but how do I do X, Y, and Z? So so definitely having the resources available to meet any um, to to be able to further explain like the nuances of the products mm-hmm. and things of that nature. Um, I would say another thing is the uh, translation itself because mm-hmm. um, we do have them typically in English, French, and Spanish, um, and I believe other languages are available upon request. However, if parents don't necessarily know that they need to request, you know. Know, the the other language then that could also be mm-hmm. you know a barrier that kind of uh, challenges challenges folks and I would say that the third thing is um, background with the tech and this goes regardless of um, regardless of language um, this is this is all parents you know some some parents and students may have had exposure to the technology before and they may be able to you know best, adapts but some for some people then this is totally brand new you know and they they may not have ever seen a zoom before or mm-hmm. seen you know ed puzzle or nearpod or mm-hmm. things of that nature <laughs> so uh just definitely um just the varying levels of um the varying levels of i guess knowledge that they're bringing in with them I was wondering, Sarah, I, don't, I just strikes me as you're talking about this, trying to capture, you know, parents from, you know, the parents are, are 
oftentimes more likely to not speak the language than the children. Like the children catch it up, you know, quickly and they can kind of start figuring it out where the parents are struggling. And I was just thinking about this, you know, like with like some UDL principles and, uh, you know, universal design learning principles and all these types of things. Um, I was just thinking of like, you know, the idea of like making training videos or, uh, or, you know, one sheets like you're talking about too, but that are not, like text free, I guess, just like image based yeah. and like, like just kind of <clears throat> visually walking people through so they can actually figure it out without having to like process language at the same time, or just, just in order to get into some of the tech. Um, what are, what are some of the ways I, I don't, and I don't know, like uh, that was just, just something that just came up with in my head. I'm like, Oh, that would be a really good way. Like it just says, I'm thinking about it, but I don't know if, the, if there are ways. <clears throat> um, I know some of these like you know, call, call this uh, system and they'll, they'll have a translator like in 150 different languages or things like that. You know, they've got all these different types of things, but, um, but what are some ways <clears throat> that you've seen that have been successful in helping onboard people, especially when you, when you're doing like the virtual things, um, do you, do you have any techniques or, uh, or advice that helps people, especially teachers, when they've got new new students that don't totally know, or new or new students' parents who don't totally know. Like, how do they how do they make that connection? Yeah, and I love what you're saying about like the the one sheeter without the text on it. Um, I think that that is you know that's definitely very helpful. Um, also, the the videos tend to work better than the one sheets because you know people get to actually see um, what you know, what's on the screen and follow along and, and things of that nature. Um, I also love what you said about having the, uh, having the hotlines in place. We do have a hotline in place in my district that parents can call and, you know, receive support. So I think that, that all of those things, uh, definitely, you know, definitely help to, uh, definitely help to make a stick. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, uh, Sarah, one of the things that we've been uh, you know, the, you were a co-author on this book on, um, on you know, uh, the digital equity strategies and closing the gap and the digital equity gap. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? I think there's still some people that are like, what, what is digital equity? <laughs> and like, <laughs> how, how does it work? And, and, and am I achieving it or am I not achieving it? Um, and, and I guess I'm sure as you talk about these things, you get a lot of people that are confused or concerned. Um, can you kind of give us the... Uh, it's on the broad picture and then maybe also some of the things that people struggle with and, and how you might kind of help them through the process of understanding and transitioning into being a better, what, what's the phrasing, better digital equ equity uh, facing citizens. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> Yeah, totally, totally. So uh, first, I got to give a huge shout out to my co-authors, Dr. Nicole Howard um, and Regina Schaefer. So we started writing this series for ISTE, um, I want to say like 2017-ish or 2018. I know the first book was released in 2018, and that was a book for higher ed. We also did a book on uh, K-12 that dropped in 2019. Um, and this was all pre-pandemic. Um, and, you know, I, at the time, people were, were starting to talk about it. They had maybe started to talk about it. I started hearing it for the first time probably in around 2014-ish. Um, but I know that it's been talked about long before that. Um, you know, there's definitely pioneers in the field that have started, um, you know, they, they uh, started looking into this like in the... Um, in the early 2000s or even pre the early 2000s. But anyway, digital equity is pretty much ensuring that students have what they need um, in order to be successful and uh, using online tools to achieve this. So um, a lot of times people think about digital equity and the conversation tends to stop with the devices um, and the broadband internet and the conversation stops there, but there's so many more layers to it that, um, that we kind of described in the, um, in the different books. Um, one of them being access to high quality instruction. Um, another one being access to transformational learning opportunities. So I know a little earlier we were talking about having students like create um, and do open-ended things as opposed to the drill and kill techniques. Um, and then, you know, there, there's just a lot to it. Um, so digital equity really, really, um, I would say that it was catapulted in our faces when this pandemic hit, because when so many places did have to go remote and, um, 
were very unprepared, you know, um, then that just kind of shone a light on how far we have to go. So, um, and a lot of places are still struggling with it. Some places made great progress. Um, and, um, you know, so this is just a continual journey. Um, and it looks different in, in different areas. Right. So uh, I was reading an article recently about where we're going in 2022 in terms of ed tech and a few of the things that were listed were hybrid environments, um, obviously asynchronous learning, interactive learning spaces and AI. So I'm wondering uh, where you think we're headed. What is your area where you think we're headed? Absolutely. So when we were preparing to do the first book, then we did um, a study um, of various um, of the horizon report. We looked at the horizon report uh, for higher ed. We looked at the horizon report for K-12 and we looked at um, news headlines, things of that nature um, for various years. So we just kind of went year by year looking at 2004, which, which I think was the first year that we could locate of the horizon report all the way up to 2018, I guess, or 2017, whenever we finished writing and just looked at the different trends um, and coded them. So um, three main things kind of stood out. The first one was, like you said, artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. just seeing how that has evolved over the last um, 15 or so years. And it's been around like since the fifties or whatever, but seeing Mm -hmm. how, you know, we've incorporated it in education over the last 15 years or so. The next one was the devices, like uh, the devices um, being more, um, you know, devices being more commonly used and more sophisticated as the years went on. Um, and the third one was social media, uh, how people have been using social media. Um, and it was really interesting to see some of these intersections. Like uh, one thing that was really cool was looking at live streaming, you know, and how that's like kind of an intersection of the devices and social media. Um, and just how that, how that has changed the world so much in such a short period of time, um, how we get stories that traditionally gatekeepers would shut down. Um, one example that we uh, that we were uh, that we mentioned was uh, George Floyd. Um, and no, I'm sorry, I take that back because that was after the book came out. But um, but there was I'm sorry, it was Michael Brown. Um, so we we discussed that and how um, there was nothing on the news when it first happened. Um, however, people were were uh, live streaming video, people were tweeting, and that completely changed, um, that completely changed the narrative. And going back to George Floyd, then you see how the impact of uh, the young lady who was recording everything that happened, how that has had such an impact. So, I mean, when you look at all of these different things, and it's, it's just amazing how, uh, how much our world has changed in such a short period of time. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. Uh, like, I mean, <clears throat> I think that's the the other big one that comes up is <clears throat> is Arab Spring, right? Like, Arab mm-hmm. Spring might yeah. never, uh-huh. never the conversation never would have happened if it wasn't for you know people posting people and streams from, and everything yep. like that. I was also yeah. interested though too, like because you mentioned social media, and I remember when we first started talking like ed tech, social media, all of these things. Like, I, I think that the way that education has moved through some of these processes is a little different than we would have imagined when the first conversations were coming up, you know, um, because in my, I remember back then I was like, Oh, maybe everybody will be teaching on Facebook or, you know, (laughs) something along those lines, right. Where it's a little bit more like kind of limited, I don't, I don't want to say it in a negative way, but kind of a limited vision of like what the actual thing might be. So it's just like, okay, what we do now is now magically going to take place in this other setting. Right. And that's not really how learning or education or anything works. But I think a lot of us kind of had these expectations. And then when we look back, we're like, oh, none of my classes are, well, I mean, I know some teachers do things like have access to their students on Facebook or, or, you know, Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is. Um, But I'm also just interested in kind of um, now look at, looking at things. uh, What do you think the, what do you think the impact of social media is on learning and education? Um, teaching, you know, like the, the actual like process of teaching and education, I guess, uh, these days. 
You know, it's interesting when you were talking about uh, teaching on Facebook, then my mind automatically just went to the metaverse, like right, right, right. <laughs> about <laughs> how, that might, how that might actually end up being a thing in a few years. Um, I think with, that's Zuckerberg's with- plan, right? Like, I mean, yeah. I, I, if, he was, if he was smart, which sometimes, sometimes it is, I guess, but like, but it would be... Um, like that would be the way to get people in, right? Is like if you're having all students going in with their teachers and like going into a metaverse AI, uh, you know, if, if we've all got our, our, I guess it's avatar world, I don't know what it is, but um, but like if, if he gets students going into that and understanding that and that's kind of their, uh, again, phrasing is wrong, but the, the meaning behind it is like that's the propaganda getting people into it and they're like, oh, okay, I'm used to this system and I know how it works. And then as they become adults and they become then future leaders, that would be the common expectation in the future, right? So that could be a possibility. I could totally see like metaverse if, uh, or meta or, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm a, <laughs> metaverse. I'm, I've got my own mixed feelings about it for sure. But <laughs> As, as one would with new things, right? Mm-hmm. Which we're not totally close off to, but it, it's brand, it, kind of new, um, you know, imagining that. But hey, reports say that in 20, what, 20, by 2040 or 2050, it's AI is going to be just, uh, it will have half um, most of our jobs. I, I was just watching a documentary on that, yeah. But, but. Uh, for many of us, it's going to create new ones and then also support those that it has automated. So, yeah, we've been, I've been talking about that to my the teachers that I'm training now. And, you know, I'm in Japan, which is like the land of robots and, and AI. So <laughs> interesting conversations. Um, so, uh, Sarah, going going back now, um, turning our, turning it back around to PLN building um because you're part of my PLN and Brent is part of my PLN and we're, you know, we're always renewing our commitment to staying connected in the educator world. Um, we do take breaks every once in a while. Everybody needs a break. We go through different stages. We come back and we've changed as educators and we grow. Um, but, and we're, you know, maybe at some point we feel saturated by so much that's out there. But um, again, I always think that there are instructors out there who don't know where to start. And I find this all the time, especially overseas. Overseas, um, there is not a lot of um, what, what's the organization, the communication between organizations isn't there. But um, where to start, even if you're, you know, in, in the States or at a, where would you start to start your, you know, building your PLN? Yeah. So the really cool thing is that over the years, um, educators have a presence on most social media that I've seen. So uh, a lot of people are on Facebook. So on Facebook, there's educator communities. You just have to search for groups and then you'll see like all of the different educator groups. So if there's one that resonates, then uh, connect there, start connecting with people within the group, you know, maybe find recommendations for other groups and branch out from there. Um, I know that WhatsApp, um, then there are some, yes. um, I know that we tried to do an edu, we tried to do an edu match group on there and, and it was going well for a while, but I'm sure I am positive that there are other ones on there as well. But, um, just wherever folks already are, look and see if there is an educator community in place there and then just connect with people within the group. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to get into deeper connections, um, going beyond just, you know, going beyond, just talking about, hey, here's what I did today. What do you think? And that there is value in those conversations. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that there's not, but also going beyond that and developing some real friendships. And that, that for me has um, changed the way that I've, that I've seen the world. Um, so, you know, definitely connecting with people at a deeper level and uh, getting recommendations from them about where else to go and just build from there. All right. Well, there's so much to continue to talk about. Um, but for now, I think we're going to wrap things up. Uh, Sarah, this has been great. Um, but we're going to jump over into our last little wrap up segment here. All right. It is time for our fun finds. And this time around, I have Blendy Matcha Latte. And um, there are individual um, packets of matcha latte that you just add water to. And it's so delicious. It's so good. And I think each little packet costs about probably like a dollar. So it's fairly affordable. You can get it on Amazon. You don't need to be in Japan. 
Yeah, yeah. Those things- no, maybe less than a dollar, like 30 cents. I don't know why I'm thinking in Japanese currency at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> those things are pretty good, actually. Yeah, um, I'm good. always surprised by like how well the Japanese and the Koreans yeah. make those instant Instant drinks. coffee. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, it's delicious. Yeah, they're, they're, they do a great job. And, and normally, as you know, I'm a, I'm a black coffee snob, but like if I, whatever sugar they're putting in there, I think there's like some extra, uh, some extra magic going on because it. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. Okay, so um, my fun find is, uh, I don't think I've talked about this before, is the uh, show on Showtime's Yellow Jackets. Um, uh, uh, have you seen this, Michelle or Sarah? Have either of you seen this? I've heard of it. It's on my list. Okay, my God. This no. Show, this show is... Is it a new show? Yeah, it's... I, okay, I then I'm... It, it's disconnected. Like, it's like one show away from the last show uh, episode of the season, but it might be series. It might be a single runoff. I don't know how they're going to end it, but um, but it's it's this really really interesting show about um, these girls, uh, high school soccer girls team that gets cra- you know stranded in. Um, in the mountains and their they're plane crashes and they get stranded in the mountains. And then it's about some of them in modern day. So it's kind of cool because they're about the same age as I am They're They would have been in high school when I was in high school and they're about my age now that they're my age. And so, um, so all the music is like, early 90s rock and like you know, those types of, they have got this whole soundtrack that's like tied exactly to the di- time when it was supposed to be but also the story is just super intense because it's it's kind of like I don't know where it's gonna go totally um but there's like implications that maybe they became cannibals out there or they had to eat each other and um all of these kind of crazy things. hey no spoilers that's not a spoiler that's from like okay. episode one like oh. they, they kind of they, they 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 there's like strong implications and so that's what people People are asking the the answer has not come out into what actually happened with things but there's like a lot of implications about that and like that's what people imagine so kind of looking back at the or sorry looking back at it from the current day that like when the people are still kind of like they're like a media sensation the few these the survivors of this are a media sensation and so people are always kind of like did you eat people? Did you, you know, did you do this stuff? Like what, what actually happened? What's the truth about what happened out there? All those types of things. Did so, you eat people? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> You're do, selling do not show. isolate that audio, please. <laughs> um, but uh, that's going to be our quote, yeah, our did, little, what did you eat people? <laughs> episode 58. Did you eat people? <laughs> <laughs> when Sarah Thomas and Brent Warner. <laughs> um, so anyways, <sighs> If, if you have access to it or if you want to get like your free trial, I think at this point you could probably, if you get like even the one week free trial, you could probably binge it and be done in that time. So um, <laughs> Yellow Jacket's pretty, pretty uh, impressive show. And the acting uh, from the, the younger kids and then the older people are like famous people too. So it's like uh, Juliette Lewis and Christina Ricci and like a bunch mm. of cool people. So um, so uh, yeah, if you're interested in that kind of show, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Sarah, what do you got? Oh my gosh. So that that show what that show's on my list, but it sounds a little it's a little <laughs> intense. A little creepy yeah. right now. But yeah. But similarly, um I had uh from for my thing, I had um great shows that just ended. Um so just wanted to um my favorite show, this might actually be one of my top three of all time. Insecure oh, just ended. Okay. Oh my gosh, I love that show. I could relate to it so much. It felt like my <laughs> early 30s you know like I mean obviously not doing you know all the crazy stuff that they did but a lot of it you know I could relate to their motivations and oh, she's amazing like that. too oh my god that's like what what a what a I, I, I haven't I haven't caught up with it but I watched the first season and I was like oh, oh my yeah. gosh <laughs> yes. I feel she's so amazing. left out I've never ever heard of either oh. of these shows oh Sarah t- t- talk about Insecure briefly yeah, so it's on HBO and it's created by uh-huh. Issa Rae and um, she pretty much it's 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 kind of like a, a young adulthood type thing where um, they're they're kind of talking about they follow these different characters um, that are kind of insecure and they are. Um, they're trying to figure out the world. They're trying to figure out life, things of that nature, their careers, their romances. 
And I mean, it's super funny, super relatable. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was such, such, such a great show. I watched it for a second time immediately after I watched the first time. Um, but I thought that it was like really cool. And then Dexter was another one, the oh, yeah. new blood. Oh, yeah. Dexter new blood. Yeah, I just finished watching that. I think that I don't know if they're going to be renewed for a season two, but they, um, you know, it was it was a really, really good show and then this is us is what i'm currently watching and that's supposed to be <gasps> i done. love that show yeah yeah that's such a good show and it's the final season and i'm so sad oh. so yeah what's so, gonna happen so you you do like it i i haven't watched it and i always like i watch the commercials and i'm like oh these commercials are like all, the commercials alone are tear jerkers like i'm not sure <laughs> oh, it's, such, it's such oh it's such a good it's a good series and you know i've i've recommended that one to my language learners and they love it oh, really? because there's so many um personalities that they can relate to and especially you know it's just it's a it's a good show great yeah, yeah. love it awesome um well those are the fun finds so let's jump out Thank you so much for listening to the show. You could win a one of a kind diesel pin by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. And that would be the first review of 2022 for us. So um, you could uh, be that person, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're giving us a shout out any other way, tag us on social media. We are on all the platforms. Yeah, if you want to support the show, we're on Patreon, and you could also buy us a coffee. Uh, oh, we do want to say thanks to uh, Denise Maduli Williams, our uh, longtime friend. She she threw a little uh, little thank you. She for gave us beginning. coffee. Yeah, she gave us some coffee. Thank you, Denise. I uh, know. I feel bad because she was a guest on the show. I'm like, you don't need to give us anything. You've already, you've already helped us. Sure, yeah. so, but but thank you, Denise, and and we hope you're doing well for the new semester as well. Um, but yeah, we are on uh, Patreon. We're on Give Us a Coffee if you like. Uh, if not, uh, totally fine. Keep moving forward with the show. This episode's show notes are available at diesel.org slash 58. That's the number 58. Or you can listen to us on uh, Voice Ed Canada as well. That's V-O-I-C-E-D dot C-A. And speaking of all the social media and those types of things, for the most part, you can find us on Twitter. The show is at Diesel Pod, and I am at Brent G. Warner. And I am at Ixy underscore Pixie. That's I-X-Y underscore P-I-X-Y. And Dr. Thomas, where can we find you? <laughs> Hey, I'm on Twitter and all of the socials at Sarah, the teacher. So Sarah, D-A-T-E-E-C-H-U-R. Sarah, the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> In French, thank you is merci. Uh, thank you for tuning into the Diesel Podcast. Merci pour avoir écouté le Diesel Podcast. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> I think I said it right. <laughs>